Oh, hell. In May 2001, my parents watched as the Jubilee Maternity Hospital was brought down. A place which stood for nearly 70 years. A place in which their first child had lived for seven hours was reduced to rubble. The Jubilee had been transferred to the Royal Victoria Hospital to make way for a new cancer centre as Belfast was gearing up for the 21st century. Something has gone wrong. Belfast wasn't prepared. With no sewage system and industry rapidly expanding, Belfast was hit by a series of fevers throughout the 1800s. In 1838, the Irish Poor Law Act was introduced to deal with the crisis. 130 unions were created across Ireland, each managed by a board of guardians. Each union was to provide a workhouse for the able-bodied poor Ours was situated in the south of Belfast, between Blackstaff Loaning, which is now the Donegal Road, and the Lisburn Road, which was back then a turnpike road. The same building plan was used for most workhouses. They give insight into the values of the time, with males at one end and females on the other. When the workhouse opened in May 1841, the Guardians placed six beds for sick inmates. Six beds. A beginning to this. A now 900 bed university teaching hospital with emphasis on renal and cancer services. Workhouse facilities quickly became inadequate and in 1847, the Guardians decided to build a fever hospital, which is presently the hospital day procedure unit. Life in the fever hospital was chaos. For the first decade, each ward had to be lit by one candle. Dr. Satan Reed became the senior physician in the fever hospital. He requested for the guardians to build a deaf house in which the piles of bodies could be stored. And as he so plainly described, nothing can be more injurious than keeping a dead body beside a patient who is suffering from the same disease. A schoolhouse was built on the grounds, however soon it was converted into an infirmary. In 1875, the infirmary became the main building on the site until the tower opened in 1986. In the late 19th century, medical knowledge was increasing rapidly. Across Europe, a campaign for better nursing had been initiated by Miss Florence Nightingale. News reached Belfast, with combined public and medical opinion demanding improvements within the nursing service. 
This directly led to Miss Ella Perry being appointed head nurse in 1884. Immediately, Miss Perry proposed that six suitable persons should train as probationers. The guardians agreed. As a result, nurse training began at the infirmary, with the number of nurses growing steadily throughout the 1890s. Many children were born inside the infirmary. Abandoned pregnant women often sought refuge there. In 1892, a separate unit was provided. This was known as Ivy Cottage. As the 20th century rolled in, the health of Belfast began to better, mainly due to improvements seen within the physical environments of the city. Patterns of disease were changing too. The number of patients in the fever hospital fell, while admissions in the infirmary increased. Belfast's population had grown to almost 300,000, the highest in Ireland. In 1914, sick and injured soldiers from the local military barracks were treated in the infirmary. Many young soldiers who survived the war died in one of Belfast's recurring epidemics. The Government of Ireland Act of 1920 paved the way for the establishment of Northern Ireland. Control of the Guardians exerted in Dublin was transferred to the Ministry of Home Affairs. The partition widened the gap between Belfast and other Irish medical centres. Vast amounts of public money were spent building much needed infrastructure for clean water and sewage disposal. Significant improvements were seen in housing, sanitation, water supplies and the availability of medical services. All the while, a division of the medical profession in the specialities was becoming more and more apparent. Yet, in 1924, the province had the highest maternal mortality and the second highest infant mortality in the UK. In Belfast, postcode differences in life expectancy remain to this day. Within the shadow of the city hospital, we can see its numbers fluctuate, street by street. Up until 1923, the infirmary had functioned without the aid of an x-ray department. It was decided that the hospital could not be considered up to date without one. Apparently the first x-ray machine gave good service, but was somewhat horrific in that when it was switched on, sparks shot out in all directions. In 1935, the Guardians officially opened the Jubilee Maternity Hospital, with Ivy Cottage retained as an isolation unit for patients with puerperal sepsis. The official opening was performed by the Duchess of Abercorn on the 31st of May, 1935. It was upgraded several times throughout the 20th century, before a move in 2000 to the Royal Victoria Hospital, one mile away. How we look at you today, and everything looks normal, and you're normal, then I'm very happy to sit back and let nature take her course, because when she's good, she's very, very good. But when she's bad, she's horrid. Anyway. The bottom line is that you've got a lovely, healthy pregnancy. One baby is coming into the world the right way around. Uh, we know <laughs> that it's, um, uh, from what we can tell, we know that it's got none of the problems your previous pregnancies yeah. had. And therefore, it should all be according to plan. Is that working? No, you go up. Up? Can you let me get And your is coming right. Let me do it. It's not okay. Huh? I don't see it. During the 1930s, there was increasing pressure on the Guardians to either upgrade the hospital or preferably build a new one. The suggestion at the time was it would best serve the needs of the community by being on the east side of the river. Eventually it was decided to build on the present site, but World War II intervened. It was also in 1939 that the story of the Guardians came to an end. The running and keeping up to date of a hospital, purely on voluntary contributions, was always difficult, especially in the years of rampant unemployment between the wars. However, 
Problems and irregularities led to a number of complaints beginning to emerge, alongside a soaring relationship with the medical student body. As a result, the guardians were suspended and replaced by two commissioners, with a third being appointed at the end of the war. The new commissioners ran the hospital with increased efficiency until the dawn of the NHS, which changed the function of Belfast City Hospital profoundly. When you cough or sneeze, whenever you talk, and even every time you breathe out, you expel small droplets of your saliva. And in hospitals, you mustn't spit them all over the place. So you wear a mask to prevent that. This is the most effective type. The shaping makes it comfortable to wear and easy to talk in, and it doesn't keep slipping off the face. Oh, and of course, to wear it under your nose is senseless. Britain had entered World War II with 3,000 hospitals, but no proper hospital system. The transformation of warfare led to a transformation of medical services. War paved the way for the creation of the welfare state, a national health service, which launched on the 5th of July, 1948. Since its introduction, national standards peer review, budgeting and bureaucracy have played increasingly important roles. For many years, medical staff and management planned extensions to the infirmary. It had long suffered from being associated with the workhouse, and for this reason, patients preferred to go to the Royal. However, change was on the way, and in 1960, the hospital authority recommended that a new central hospital be built on the site of the workhouse infirmary as part of a major redevelopment plan. The 50s and 60s saw the introduction of steel and concrete on a much larger scale, combined with improvements in elevator systems. This meant buildings could be carried out on a vertical plane to a much quicker and greater extent than before. The site was cleared in 1967. And in May 1971, in the presence of senior doctors and nurses, a cylinder filled with various items belonging to the hospital, was screwed into the foundation stone. The contract for the building of the tower was signed for seven million, with a completion date of July 1976. Part of the history of the city hospital is the length of time it took for the tower to come into being. Many difficulties hindered the progress of the building. Two workmen were murdered by gunmen on site, and abnormally bad weather affected the operation of cranes. While the University Grant Committee refused to recognise the new hospital for undergraduate training, unless adequate teaching purposes were provided in the tower. In 1986, ten years after its projected date of opening, Belfast finally had its city hospital at a cost of 72 million instead of the original seven. Nevertheless, the tower represented real progress as an expansion of a range of specialist services was seen and the new chapter of healthcare began. Here is a world in conflict. But in this world of opposed force, there is order. Nature has its own balance. To each action, there is reaction. Out of violence, tranquility. In the 70s and 80s, Belfast was seen as a center of excellence in neurosurgery and traumatic injuries, pioneering many treatments. Sometimes, those responsible for an incident were treated alongside those injured in the same incident. A common sentiment for any nurse is everyone is treated the same. The city hospital was designated for the treatment of army, police and prisoners. Staff had special instructions in handling cloths, ID tags, firearms, bullets and other evidence. On one occasion during the Troubles, 10 RUC officers were admitted for observation on the same night. When sister unlocked a controlled drug cupboard, nine handguns fell out. One less than there should have been. When sister inquired, she was told that it was under the pillow of the officer in the first bed who was guarding the others. Nature has 
its own balance. To each action, there is reaction. Out of violence, Casualty in the hospital was a vital learning experience for nurses in training, but a burden on its staff. After a distressing night in the department, Sister Linda Malone wrote, Here he comes, an innocent man. I hope he doesn't die. We work our way through air bases. Quick, cut the clothes. What do we see? Blood. Everywhere. I say a prayer. Doctors here. Policeman there. Lots of nurses. Everywhere. All working and fighting for this man's life. Then suddenly, I think of his wife. Our heads are hot. Our hearts beat fast. But all in vain, he breathes his last. For this poor man, the fight is lost. His family's left to pay the cost. We all drive home, tears in our eyes, the memory warm of how we tried. I need to talk, to vent my grief. I can't relax, can't get to sleep. I hear the newsman broadcast, another man shot dead. To most he's just a number, to me, a face within my head. In the pre-NHS days, a strong moral and ethical background guided staff of the voluntary hospitals. Their clinical skills and ethical standards laid a foundation of present-day medicine here in Northern Ireland. It is not generally realised how complex a modern hospital is. Catering, administration, transport, IT security, all play a vital part in this edifice. The hospital's outstanding quality is the devotion and courage of its staff, who work tirelessly, regardless of the risk to themselves. By the late 20th century, doctors in the city were still working over 100 hours a week. The introduction of the European Working Time Directive of 1998 alleviated some of these strenuous demands. The 21st century has seen significant political and economic change in the aftermath of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. The opening decade saw new patterns in demographics across Northern Ireland. Cancer, obesity, diabetes, drug and alcohol abuse are some of the biggest healthcare challenges which face Northern Ireland today. There is also mental health. (coughs) There is also mental health. More people in Northern Ireland, compared to the rest of the UK, have a mental health condition, as large parts of our society reel in from the previous century and deal with the collective trauma of the Troubles. Many mental health patients of the past never received the treatment and environments that they deserved. A new acute mental health facility has recently been opened where Windsor House used to stand, a space which encapsulates 21st century care. It is a contrast to the endless corridors of the tower and offers a progressive template for such places in the future. There's such a 
such places in the future. For such places in the future. For such places in the future. In April 2020, Belfast City Hospital became part of the UK's Nightingale Hospital Network to help deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Elective surgeries were hit the hardest. Cancer treatment and potential diagnosis severely affected in the initial few months. Across the UK, tens of thousands of lives have been lost. These Nightingale hospitals, named after the mother of modern nursing, Miss Florence Nightingale, who demanded respect for not only medical knowledge, but those belonging to the medical profession. Something has gone wrong, and sometimes things do go wrong, and we need fixed up. When the Jubilee Maternity Hospital was demolished in 2001, it created an ideal site for the new Northern Ireland Cancer Centre. Consultants have changed. Equipment has evolved. The words that greeted the staff and families of the Jubilee may be gone. Yet they find refuge in the people and places which come next. Here at whatever hour you come, you will find light and help and human kindness. I have very poignant memories of the um, of the place, you know, just going back, even looking at the uh, front steps, you know, just remembering walking up there full of hope and um, remembering what happened. Uh, our first son was born there and, and died. He lived seven hours, so, um, you know, uh, an event of our lives that happened there actually, you know, it, it changed our lives, so it, it does have a very poignant um, uh, place for for us and I'm sure for for many people, you know. We have um, other children and explain that that's where their baby brother was born and there's a real sense of um, of history and you know, sort of memories that are, are there. And, um, you know, that, that, that really interests both of us uh, as artists. And, you know, maybe we can um, gather some in images together and, uh, you know, put, put together a, a piece of work. And now I will introduce the chairman of the board of management. Our picture tells a little of the work of our great hospital. It cannot tell the anguish and misery hidden behind a long waiting list. A young mother, pale, weak, weary, comes to the hospital. After careful examination, the doctor tells her, do not worry, you will get quite well, but you must come into hospital for a slight operation. Well, thank you, sir. When can I come? I am very sorry. Our beds are quite full. I shall put your name on the waiting list. Oh, sir, I cannot carry on any longer. I cannot take care of my home and my little children. The same tale is repeated in each department every day. 
Is the whole thing not a tragedy? It might have been you. Thank you.